Hi, I'm Lauren Kennedy and welcome to episode 78 of Art This Week. This week we speak with Michael Craig Martin at the Goss Michael Foundation about his work now on display at the Foundation's new space and at the Nasher Sculpture Center. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm Lauren Kennedy with Art This Week and I'm here with Michael Craig Martin at the Goss Michael Foundation talking a little bit about the highlights from the permanent collection. Um, actually, just to start, so you're displayed twice in Dallas right now, here at the Goss Michael Foundation and then newly installed at the Nasher Sculpture Center as well. Yes, this is a, quite a treat for me, coming to Dallas and having things in, and such different things in each yes. of the two places. Uh, couldn't be nicer for me. Oh, that's great. And it's such an interesting, um, for both of these pieces, they are so different, uh, different incarnations of your work. Um, you you know, very concerned with drawing the everyday object, but then also you have an example of portraiture here at, at the Goss Michael Foundation with the portraits of Kenny and, and Michael, um, George Michael. So do you maybe want to speak a little bit about how different they are, but how they both kind of relate to what's central to your practice? Well, I, I mean, obviously the, the central thing in the, my practice has always been drawing, and a, a very simple kind of drawing, uh, an outline drawing, um, and I, I'm not interested in cartoon-like drawing. Right. Uh, I, they're, they're quite, uh, there's, I try to make them as accurate as I can, but also impersonal, but impersonal in the way that the objects that I draw are impersonal. I mean, I always think if you, you know, if, we, if, you, um, if you have a chair, you know, dining room chairs, well, you have six chairs around the table, they're all different, but it'd be hard to tell one from the other. Uh, but they are different, mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, I mean, if, with another object, say something like your mobile phone, there may be tens of thousands of them in the world, but you love your own, right. so it feels different, than the, although actually it's the same. So it's that thing of trying to find something that's so specific that, um, yeah. that you've been feeling about it at the, same, at the same time as not make it personal in some obvious way. And then also these being portraits and 2D objects really here at the Goss Michael Foundation, but the, the garden fork red at the National Sculpture Center, which is, is three-dimensional, you can walk around it. You, there are different experiences. But the, th the thing about the fork at the Nasher is that um, there's, a, there's a funny irony about the fork because it's a, the, the sculpture is a two-dimensional drawing of a fork that has been made into a three-dimensional object. object. Yes. So, it, although the object itself is actually three-dimensional and stands up I independently, it's right. actually flat. So that all the illusionism mm -hmm. is not in the molding of the object, right. but it's in the two-dimensionality of the drawing, and yet the thing is a three-dimensional object. So really, in some way, it's a sculptural drawing. It's a sculptural drawing become a sculpture. Which is it becomes complicated, but it's still very interesting to think it's, about. It, there's something very not, and the idea that the that uh, that the drawing is is going into the ground as right. though it was an actual real. There's a very form. physicality to it. So it's so, yes. So the drawing has taken on a kind of physicality that one doesn't associate with drawing. Right. And that that seems very interesting to me. And then here with the portraits, because I'd been drawing uh, objects in this way, the simple way for you know for 30 years. And then when I got asked to do a portrait, I thought, well, how else am I supposed to do it? I just draw the way I draw everything else. So I started mm -hmm. to draw faces the same way. And that, that really was very, very interesting to me, more interesting than I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I've always colored in things in a certain kind of way and, right. and in a way where the color has no relation to the thing that's been drawn, except to differentiate things. So mm -hmm. in the portraits, the two eyebrows are always the same color, the lips are color. Uh, the eyeballs are, are the same color. So there's, there's certain groupings of things mm -hmm. which are the same, and then, but, and, and every place where the skin appears, whether it's in the hands and the face, so that's the all the same. Right. So you have certain, it has a certain yeah. logic to the color without the colors themselves being logical. The mm -hmm. face might be pink and then become blue and then green. Right. It almost feels liberating for the color to not necessarily reference at all. What, it, 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 what I think is interesting is that um, one of the things that was very liberating for me was the realization that it didn't really matter what color you made right. something. If, if you got the other colors right, it was all right. And then something else that I think is really interesting about your work, especially your earlier work to present, is this kind of drawing away from using actual objects to the representation of objects. And um, obviously your work 
presently is, is very concerned with technology and um, you, know, you don't actually feel your hand in it and, and you don't in the earlier pieces as well but maybe you could speak about that, that transition from using a, a physical object, a ready-made object, to using the, the drawing of that. Well, one, one, I, in, as you said, in my earliest or earlier work, when I, you know, in the uh, late 60s and into the 70s, um, I used real ordinary objects. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, you might, if you're going to make a, a sculpture, what sculpture could be better than a chair already is? So why do anything? Right. You already have chair. one. It's a chair. It's already a fabulous sculpture. So I, I tried to use objects with, using their given characteristics. On the, uh, on the other hand, I started to realize, as I worked in that way, that you kind of use up the energy of an object. Once you've used an object in one work, it's very hard to use that object again in a different way. And then I understood, and that seemed to me, I suddenly thought, that's why artists make images of things, because the images are reusable. Right. Yeah. And you can reuse an image in a way that you can't you reuse an object. So, uh, w and so uh, to explore this, I, I've, uh, I made one drawing of a book open, one drawing of a book closed, one drawing of a pair of shoes, one drawing of a table, and 30 years later I still use, draw I keep adding to this body of drawings, but I've never, drawn, an I've never drawn another book. book, I've never drawn another table. Ah. It's because you can change them by changing the scale, by changing the point of view, by changing the color, by changing, there's all sorts of other, and they can have these changes of meaning, whereas that would have been, ver that's not, a real object doesn't have that flexibility because as soon as you turn it into an image, it becomes part of language. Mm -hmm. And just like our words, our sentences are made up of, frankly, a very small number of words, the mm -hmm. ones we use every day, it's a tiny vocabulary and yet we're constantly making different meanings. We don't, we don't feel at all that we're repeating ourselves all the time. We're saying different things at different times, but we're actually using a tiny body of words to do that. So I'm, I think of the image as doing something similar to that. That's interesting. And then my final question for you would be, um, being on display here at the Goss Michael Foundation with um, some of your former students who are now very much colleagues of yours and, and fellow artists, um, how does it feel to, I guess, be shown alongside them? And would you say that as you have continued to work a around them and with them um, to some extent, would you have said you've learned something from them as well? Or Well, of course, I feel, I feel obviously a great deal of parental pride. Sure. Uh, it would be very hard not to feel that. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled with, about that. And I, uh, there's a certain way I sometimes think that um, uh, I feel very comfortable with the work of my own students. I like being shown in their context. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes think, well, maybe what I did when I was teaching is I created a context within which I could feel comfortable. <laughs> That's funny. You just kind of created a, a, a little world for myself. <laughs> Your own personal art <laughs> It world. looks very generous, but in the fact it was really Michael turned Craig out to be very selfish after all. <laughs> well, it, it's a beautiful selfish world and one that we're happy to have been in, a part of today. And oh, thank well, you so th much th for speaking with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. We want to thank Michael Craig Martin for speaking with us. More information on him can be found at michaelcraigmartin.co.uk. Again, we want to thank the Goss Michael Foundation for letting us film in the gallery. More information on the recent move and current exhibition, go to gossmichaelfoundation.org. For more information on the Nasher, check out nashersculpturecenter.org. That's it for this week, and thanks for watching. Still got your polaroid